Hello, and uh, thank you for coming tonight. Sorry about the microphone, it seems a bit excessive, but uh, we're recording this and we don't pick up any sound if we don't use microphones. So, uh, thanks for coming. Um, I suppose some of you are psychologists here, which is fantastic. We need more psychologists to come along and take some interest in this subject for reasons that uh, will be clear. So, you are just raising your hands if you're a psychologist? You don't have to stand up and say, my, my name is <laughs> John Barry, yeah, nothing to be ashamed of, exactly. Um, my name is John Barry, I'm a psychologist too, a clinical hypnotherapist is the, the clinical aspect of what I do. Most of what I do is research. Martin here. I'm Martin Seeger, consultant clinical psychologist, adult psychotherapist, many other things besides. So, uh, yeah, this is a subject we've been working on for many years, so... And Kate can't be with us tonight, so Kate, who would have been with us as a job interview, which is obviously very important, but she must uh, attend. Yeah. Um, it's kind of ironic, she's the person who did all the interviews for this study, but she, <laughs> has it to, she can't present it because she's got to She was looking forward to presenting it because she's been offered a, a, an interview for a job, so. Yeah. Okay, so um, I'll get things going anyway, and we'll have um, time at the end if anybody wants to ask any questions. Um, possibly even during it, if you get a burning for <coughs> a strong urge to heckle. A strong urge to heckle, you know. yeah, indeed. Or even just to applaud. Okay, so look, a little bit about um, what we're doing first. Um, myself and Martin um, are involved with something called the Male Psychology Network. In fact, we started it up a few years ago um, with the, the view to um, a kind of uh, doing something about the mental health of men and boys, which seems to be overlooked, I think, quite a bit. Um, we're very good at dealing with lots of different things as psychologists, but we tend to have a bit of a blind spot for issues facing men and boys. And this is us at uh, our conference last year. Um, and uh, we have this, we're going to have our fourth annual conference this year. In fact, in this room, I think, uh, we're going to be here on the 23rd and 24th of June. And we got lots of interesting stuff on that day, including uh, we got um, uh, Rory O'Connor uh, from the University of Glasgow, who's an expert in, in suicidology. He'll be talking about identifying and uh, suicide behaviours early and, and the kind of interventions that we can use. We're going to have lots of stuff that's really interesting. Um, I would urge you to have a look at our website and, um, and check out the timetable of events. We're doing some stuff that you won't see other places, and you, you'll start to think, why aren't I seeing this in other places? We've also got Norman Lamb, politician. It's quite useful to have um, ex minister. He's an ex minister, isn't he? He's not current minister, but he was in the uh, coalition government. He was quite involved in, in raising awareness of mental health. But I think he's quite keen as part of that to look at you know, gender issues in mental health, public health, really. Uh, and we got, got uh, Marv Westwood, haven't we? He's a really good specialist in PTSD, working with veterans, helping soldiers to kind of who've been through terrible experiences to kind of process that through various ways of using male-friendly kind of techniques to help soldiers work together to get over these things. So there's some interesting variety of talks. And uh, I mean, Marv Westwood, I mean, if you haven't seen these he's definitely worth seeing. We have others too, Sue Whitcomb on parental alienation syndrome, and again, you, as psychologists, you, you, you probably won't have heard of parental alienation syndrome, and neither will anybody else, um, but it's actually a, a, probably a massive issue. Oh, you have. You have it. You have. Great. I'm so glad. Lots of psychologists haven't, so I'm, I'm really glad that you have. Oddly, I wrote something about that, I think, this week, and then had it. Good timing there. Yeah. This is very good timing. Yeah, it's um, obviously a really serious issue uh, affecting so many children around the, the world and uh, it's been a time of the book. So, uh, so we've got lots of things. That if you're a psychologist, even if you're not a psychologist, if you're just interested in human nature, you'll be seeing uh, human nature in a, a different light at, at the conference. So moving on with today. No, we're not moving on with today. We've got more stuff about us. But this just says how great we are. We've done lots of good things and we'll continue to do great things. And like we're, hopefully we're going to have a male psychology section of the British Psychological Society quite soon. 
and there's going to be a ballot on that um, in the next couple of months. We've we done that. You know, in the next few months, we're having a meeting tomorrow to talk about that. But yeah. they can only ballot, put a ballot out for all of the psychologists in the country when they've got a number of ballots to do at the same time because of the cost. I think it's quite a few thousand, 25 grand or something, just to put a postal ballot out. So they can't just do one section. They have to have a number of ballots going on, at least two. Anyway, we're going to have a ballot very soon. Yeah. So that's something to look forward to. Um, so one of the, the issues that we're interested in in the Men's Psychology Network is um, the issue of um, male suicide. I mean, about three and a half times the number of uh, men who commit suicide than women do, uh, or three and a half times more uh, men than women do. Um, yet men go to uh, seek help for psychological issues much less than women do. And really, uh, I, I personally, every time I kind of think about that, that fact or those, those facts, um, it makes me kind of feel a bit alarmed, and it kind of makes me think, what, you know, why aren't they going to seek help? Why are they going off and killing themselves? And, and this, is, this is one of the kind of, the, the kind of drivers behind the male psychology section we're quite interested in, and in why men are committing suicide, what we do to prevent it, and what we can do as psychologists maybe to, to make what we do a bit more uh, appealing to men, because it could be that men are going to, to seek therapy when they're having problems or not psychological therapies at least, um, because there's something about psychological therapies that men aren't that keen on. And if that's the case, we really need to be doing something about that. Well, there, there's a question there, isn't there? You either, there's a kind of question, you either get men to change, to use existing psychological therapies more on the assumption that there's something sort of outdated about men and they need to change, which is, you hear that narrative a lot, or you can try and adapt therapists to suit men so that they come along because it feels more kind of relevant to them but you can possibly, I don't know if you can do both of those things but I think both of those things are starting to happen a little bit aren't they? Yeah, I mean you, you can understand why, why people would say that men just need to open up with this kind of thing but um, it might not be the best approach to help men to open up just the system that they do. So um, uh, in terms of, of um, how well men and women do have therapy. Um, we don't really have very much information about that. Uh, interestingly, in psychology, we don't seem to, to present our data um, on the outcomes of therapy by gender. It's, it just doesn't seem to be the kind of thing that we do. It's as if we make the assumption that men and women are, are the same and they'll respond to, to therapy in the same sort of way. Um, and, and interestingly, in, in other disciplines, you know, it's just a kind of, Gender is treated as a, a demographic and just routinely run. But in psychology, we don't tend to do that a lot with, um, when we're looking at the outcome of treatments. But those, just picking up on that, those two things are quite interesting that we know that men aren't seeking help as much as women and we're sort of trying to get them to open up. And yet we're researching the people who do come along as if there weren't any differences. So we're spending half of our energy as a society trying to sort of appeal to the difference try to change, change men, whether that's right or wrong, and then we're, we're not researched, we're doing gender-blind research, so it's the danger of the average, isn't it? If you, someone once said to me, if you have your feet in the refrigerator and your head in the oven, you have an average temperature, and you're dead. <laughs> so average is a pointless, is, science is interested in, in difference and in correlation, and that should inspire all of us, difference is a good thing. Diversity is a good thing, but we gender, we all get a bit, I think, a bit afraid of the subject and we just throw everything into one pot. So that's kind of why science is so behind on this the subject, why we're trying to see the interest in it. Absolutely. I mean, uh, um, people can get quite defensive if you start talking about gender differences. Um, I mean, and it's part of the culture as psychologists that, that we're uh, steeped in. We don't even realise how, how kind of tense we get when start asking about gender differences and it doesn't help us as scientists it's, it's not the kind of thing that you can use also the, the british psychological society for a psychologist or just then generally any service provider is trying to tailor an approach to suit the people using it if you and the, the tailoring metaphor is if you if you want to give someone a suit of clothes that fits them and you're a tailor you measure them and then you give them a different size suit so you treat people equally 
by giving them the suit that fits their size. But we, with therapy, we just give everyone a one size fits all therapy. So that's a, that's a problem. I mean, that's true for possibly within gender groups as well. It's, it's true for, not just for gender, it's true for uh, a psychologist who's supposed to formulate these very careful, detailed plans of how we help people individually, but we don't usually, we're not really conscious of factoring in gender so specifically. And uh, this is a metaphor that the BPS are using about tailoring. The BPS always lo loves the tailoring metaphor. I don't know if it's going out of fashion, but when I trained, which is a long time ago now, I was talking about tailoring interventions to people. You know, if you're three foot tall and you want to go on fence, you have to stand on a box. If you're six foot tall, you don't need a box. Absolutely. So, you, know, you don't just give them the same intervention. Yeah, I completely agree. It's, uh, you have to. to it's, it's, I suppose, about being client centered too. You have to kind of, uh, you know, really yeah. like to see if that. So, um, when we do, in the rare instances where people have looked at gender differences and outcomes, we can find some things that are really quite interesting. Um, a study by Kevin Wright and McLeod recently found that uh, the long term outcome of, of uh, brief uh, counseling therapy for people was significantly better for women than for men. Now, I mean, this, this to, to me is a kind of thing that should be really alarming. I mean, and this wasn't a small study, but this, this was uh, quite a large scale study. Uh, so we really should take this stuff very seriously. Like, we, we're kind of, you know, we're psychologists, and we're, we, you know, we're not here for half the population, we're here for everyone. So we've got to make sure that what we're doing is going to be effective for, for everybody, I think. Um, and th there's, a, there's lots of examples, I'll just include this, this um, example about um, smoking cessation therapy with hypnosis, because my background is hypnosis, but, but there's, there's lots of other examples, but you have to really dig around and look for them. I mean, it's worth pointing out that even the, the Centre for Suicide Research, which I think is based in Oxford, isn't it? When we sort of inquired into a number of, I mean, suicide, the gender differences in suicide we all know are pretty big, you know, like 78% or something male. Uh, and yet the Suicide Research Centre wasn't really looking at gender <laughs> in its own. It's just incredible. So as scientists, what you're interested in is actually becomes in why people aren't interested. That becomes the interesting thing, that we're not studying those differences, even though they're staring us in the face. We're, we're blind to them, so gender blindness is something obviously we've got interested in uh, as to why science is, is really kind of making assumptions that about suicide and, and gender neutral, even though 78% of suicide, you know, you always go to lectures about social deprivation and suicide and poverty, education, demographics, and everything except the most obvious thing. But, you know, it is changing, it is changing. It's a, a real elephant in the room. I think once you start to kind of see things in, in terms of the elephant in the room, the, the problem of, of male suicide not being treated as a gender issue, I think it does make you stop and, and think about whether we're approaching things in the most sensible, practical way. Um, so what, what we've done in this study is we've uh, decided to ask uh, therapists, uh, experienced therapists, um, uh, we have uh, counsellors, psychotherapists, and clinical psychologists in this study. Um, and we ask them uh, uh, whether they've noticed any uh, differences in the way that men and, uh, and women clients of theirs respond to therapy, or the way that they seek help, various aspects, whether like, gender makes any difference in, in, in their experience in their therapy. Um, and we've done this with three different groups. We, we looked at life coaches first. We looked at life coaches because we thought life coaching is the kind of uh, um, treatment modality that might suit them, being kind of more about sort of problem solving. And this is this is a few years ago when we were just sort of sounding out ideas and kind of just kind of going on sort of conversations with people. So they, these weren't very kind of well researched kind of reasons for, for picking people like life coaches, but it turns out it kind of it did make sense in the end. So uh, life coaches uh, don't really deal with kind of emotions kind of, and kind of the past uh, to, to uh, the same extent as you get in psychotherapy, for example. So when we interviewed uh, 20 life coaches, um, we found that um, almost all of them reported sex differences of one kind or another in the way that uh, their 
clients benefited from therapy or approached therapy, the kinds of things that they seem to prefer. Um, and really interestingly and unexpectedly, we found that 65% of our therapists uh, of our life coaches um, kind of showed some sort of reluctance to, to talk about gender differences that they observed in, in, their, uh, in their practice. And we thought this was really kind of quite interesting. Uh, Do we have a gender difference in those coaches? Yeah, well, that's uh, <coughs> just exactly the kind of question you would ask. We need to kind of research on all these things. Uh, yeah, uh, you should have been on that project and, and you will have to. I think we, uh, the gender distribution of life coaches was roughly 50-50, is that right? I can't remember, to be honest, the details. So. Yeah, we were a bit gender blind ourselves uh, in yeah. some of these early studies. Um, so, uh, but, but one of the key things we found is that this sort of reluctance to talk about gender differences. Like, for example, people would say things like that. Um, that um, they, they, like, I hate to generalize, but women tend to kind of want emotion-focused type uh, approaches and men prefer a kind of a, a just a problem-focused or sort of solution-focused thing. Men just want to fix the problem. They don't want to deal with their feelings very much. Um, so we also looked at uh, a, a small study of hypotherapists and we found that 100% of hypotherapists found um, sex differences in some aspect of, of uh, behavior or the, the kind of response of their lives. And uh, so again we move on to today's study. Yep. What, what are you defining as a sex difference? Uh, well, th th these uh, are, well I mean it actually is just a difference between the way men and women behave in therapy in terms of things like their response to therapy, whether they have a, a good response to that, whether they prefer type of approach, like a kind of a, an emotion focus rather than a, a rational sort of solution focused, that, that kind of thing, how they seek help, that was another type of thing. So, so this is what we mean. So and and these um, these three studies here that I'm talking about um, are all they're qualitative studies. So we kind of didn't really set out to define things in any clear way ourselves. We kind of left it up to the therapist to tell us what their experience was. So it's kind of like this is very much exploratory work. Like we're, we're kind of, I, I think very sensibly, not thinking that we know what the answer is in advance. It's not hypothesis testing. Uh, so we, did, we didn't really define things. We kind of, as much as possible, left it really kind of nice and kind of vague so that the therapists themselves would tell us all about their experience. So, uh, so I'm talking a bit now about grounded theory methodology. I won't kind of go on about this too much because there's probably a lot of you won't be kind of uh, too familiar with this. Um, but this is just uh, Kate included this slide um, about this is kind of like about reflexivity and disclosure about about the therapists that, that you get a lot in uh, kind of grounded theory and qualitative type work. Um, so our participants were okay. 20 participants, 5 men and 15 women. Okay, so that answers that question. Uh, semi structured interviews, in other words, uh, we had kind of <coughs> sketchy sort of questions that we pitched to people, but basically, they, we, if people deviated uh, around those uh, uh, the, the, the questions and talked about something else that they thought was more interesting, but still on the topic, we would include that. Um, and we had eight psychologists, eight psychotherapists, four counsellors um, who all have well uh, qualifications and have been practicing for at least two years. And they recruited. Yeah? What's the difference between a uh, psychologist and a counsellor? Okay, that's the one, for, one for afterwards. One for afterwards. Uh, but they're, the price? They're, they're all for, for the, the purposes of. of what we're talking about here, they're all psychological therapists. They're all therapists who deal with, with kind of talking type therapies rather than kind of medicine or any other type of therapy. But, uh, but I'm not trying to skip over this. Basically, yeah. a psychologist is like sort of uh, does the science training in psychology and then they apply it to uh, part of the application of that is like to therapy and counseling. Counseling is more just specifically to relationships. Um, yes, it's narrow. The previous slide, you had 
forensic psychology oh, yeah. in fact? Forensic psychology, psychology applied to criminal behaviour, prisoners, people who've, uh, whose behaviour has gone into extreme areas where they committed crimes, and you end up working with what would be called damaged personalities. So it's kind of, uh, it's at the more sort of dangerous end, if you like, of the human spectrum. So, um, so we recruited our sample of, of uh, different therapists, from starting off with people that we knew and then asking them to ask people that they knew. So we kind of uh, something of a snowball sampling type technique. And uh, the interviews lasted about 20 to 45 minutes. And so these are a couple of examples of the questions we used. Uh, some people say that men are less inclined to seek help than women are, including psychological therapies. What are your thoughts on this based on your experience as a therapist? Um, can you tell me any thoughts or feelings you have, if at all, on whether the gender of the client has any influence on therapy? Do you think that men and women present emotional or psychological problems differently? If so, how? How do you think men's health seeking behaviour might be improved? So all of those questions, actually except for the last one, are all kind of as open as you can be while guiding people in a particular direction of the topic. Um, I think the, the one on help seeking is kind of, it's a bit more leading, it's kind of implies that... It's very leading, yeah, in a way, but it's important because <laughs> that's the main narrative we've all got. Yeah, yeah, uh, and I think just people tend to ex uh, expect that... Uh, that you, you, could, you could easily ask, how do you think society's help providing behaviour might be improved? Which is actually more my, closer to my personal view. It's, it's an important thing because if you can encourage men to seek help more, it's, it's a good thing. Yeah. But if you can encourage them to, it's how we define help and how we make help seeking congruent with, with, with the more, you know, typical, if you like, masculine view of, of what would be a good way of getting something sorted. So, but that uh, will be revealed later. Okay, so. Um and here's some reflexivity. This is probably a bit boring unless you're really interested in, in a grounded theory methodology. But it's just sort of disclosing the kind of the, the backgrounds of the interests and the, the points of view of the, of the people involved in the research. Um, so uh, Kate notes here that, um, that she had a, a friend who turned to substance abuse at one point and um, thought that therapy couldn't help him and he committed suicide eventually. And, uh, and, and one of her, her thoughts was, I wonder whether this will affect how I interpret um, any of the interview material or how I, I kind of, how I ask questions. I mean, so, so this is one of the things when you're doing this sort of research where you're more kind of uh, not really dealing with numbers or statistics, but more dealing with, with uh, people in a, in a very kind of human sort of way. And uh, you have to try and, well, in, in, at least in this particular methodology, uh, grand theory method, um, you have to try and be as objective as you can or at least recognise how your preconceptions, your beliefs, your life experiences might uh, affect or, or even distort the way that you are conducting the study. And yeah, that, that's in two ways because psychologically if you your own subjective sort of conscious and unconscious sort of beliefs about things will influence how you ask questions to people and your, all your when, they, when you're asking someone, they're, they're getting that question from you. So, you know, we try to teach as a trained psychologist that you can't, you're, you, you only ever observe someone's reaction to you. You never observe anyone in a vacuum. Science needs to be aware of the interchange that's going on. So, so there's some effort to do that here. And um, as part of this method too, there's a memo taking, so you make notes along the way to kind of help you reflect and, uh, on what you're doing. And uh, this is one of Kate's notes. I was aware today during an interview discussing the reluctance of men to engage in therapy that I remained mindful to keep the interview as objective as possible, remaining open to any answers given uh, without any exception or expectation that answers may be congruent with my subjective experience. So that's just something that you wrote to yourself just, um, as a kind of a memo to self. So the analysis um, is done by taking all of the, the 20 interviews and transcribing them, so, so kind of uh, typing them all up, and, uh, and then kind of putting them all together and kind of going through the whole lot of them 
and go through a process of, of coding, um, and which is like you, you start off doing kind of fairly sort of uh, unreflective line by line coding. So you just pick up on any words or phrases that, that might be vaguely interesting in any sort of way. So you, in other words, you're not bringing any of your kind of theory about what's going on to, to the process at the beginning. Um, and then you do a more focused coding, so you kind of you look at the, the bits that you've highlighted in the line by line coding, and you see whether any of those seem to sort of hang together in, in terms of themes. So you might get kind of kind of clusters of words that might seem to sort of uh, suggest kind of uh, some sort of link with each other. And after that, you can then take those those uh, little um, focus codes and kind of group them into to still higher constellations of ideas and this is where you then start seeing whether groups of ideas really do seem to, to have uh, conceptual links with each other whether they seem to make sense of of, uh, of what's what narrative might be going on uh, within the transcripts and then at the very end you end up with a kind of a, an overall sort of theme uh, called a core category And uh, the, so the results of, of this uh, study and the study interviews uh, was that, uh, the, the, so our core category, our main overall thing, was that uh, whether it's nature or nurture, men want a quick fix and women want to explore. So men want a quick fix for their feelings and women want to, uh, uh, sorry, a quick fix to whatever problem that they're facing, and uh, which could be their feelings, and women want to explore their feelings. So that's the overall. Thing. In some ways, I mean, uh, my kind of personal reflection is that, that you could, if you went to the bus stop at the front of the, the university and, and asked people, like, how do you think men and women might approach therapy differently, they'd probably say something like this. I mean, you know, it, it seems to me that, like, we, we kind of went to a, a lot of effort in some ways just to find out something that seems obvious. But on the other hand, we seem to have lost our way, I think, so much as psychologists. Uh, that we, we're kind of ignoring things that are actually really quite obvious, like the elephant in the room. Yeah, I mean, if everyone in the bus stop did believe that, it would be at least the duty of psychology to factor that into the way things are done, but it's not. So if we're, if we've got a general sort of, and if, of course, if you look in our, if you look in our culture, you just look at any comedy, you know, look at Friends or any sort of what famous comedy. It's all based on gender difference and tensions. And, you know, it's, it's, made, it's very humorous, so you, you, it makes it really interesting. And all about great artists, writers, storytellers, back to gender in. I think artists and writers and filmmakers, and novelists, poets are way ahead on gender from psychologists. We're way behind. But the point is that there are these differences in our culture, but then we're delivering services. We're not just psychologists, but governments. You know, governments are saying we need to give people CBT saying, you know, who does it work best for gender-wise anyway, it does break it down in other categories, but, you know, CBT is just assume if you've got depression, you've got depression, you know, male or female, it's the same thing, just give, give it CBT. So, uh, yeah, I mean, this study in some ways is fairly straightforward and simple, but it needs to be done because we're not, we're just not asking these questions. And in a way, I mean, it's straightforward and simple, but it seems to replicate what the other two straightforward and simple studies did. When once you have start getting replications to, to this degree, it does make you kind of stop and think, well, actually maybe we're, we're studying something actually that's good, we're finding something genuine here. So um not a sense that the participants, that's the therapist, proposed that gender the gender of the client does not uh, sorry, does have an influence on therapy. Um, and three categories were identified from our analysis. Um, the first category, the impacts of gender on aspects of therapy. The uh, second character was, uh, category was the impact of society. The third category, the reluctance to attribute differences to gender. So our first category, the impact of gender on aspects of therapy. Um, so what I'm going to do is just quote uh, from some of the interviews. And we've removed any identifying details about people. So, uh, but they're quotes from, uh, taken from the interviews with these therapists. Um, and so for this first category, throughout the three subcategories of category one, 
therapists identified various ways in which gender has an impact on therapy. So one therapist said, in my experience, sometimes there seems to be a longer period of engagement needed with male clients. So I found that sometimes women are kind of ready to start talking about things straight away. Where I've noticed with men that either attendance can be a bit patchy at the beginning, or there can be a lot of talking around the subject. And uh, by the way, if, if you were a therapist or if you've got any experience in therapy, do reflect on this and, and just ask yourself, does this tally with my own experience? Just to comment briefly on that point from another angle, we did a brief piece of work with the Central London Samaritans. We, we did a year's worth of training on gender, male gender issues for all the volunteers. We didn't teach or preach at them about how to talk to men. We just exposed them to loads of stuff on male culture, you know, songwriting and songs, why are men writing all these songs about love and, and whatever. Uh, and then we, we, did, we did various things. But having done this year of training, we measured the baseline and we measured an after measure uh, to see how long the phone calls were. This is quite an objective <coughs> measure. How long the phone calls with male callers were, they'd gone up. But having done this year of exposure, to the Samaritans volunteers about exposing them to think about men as having a slightly different culture, on average of course, because men and women overlap enormously, but it's just an average difference. Uh, you know, but there is a difference. Uh, having done that, we found that the length of phone calls with male, male callers were increasing because the volunteers were listening differently. It's nothing to do with the men. We hadn't gone out there and changed men at all. We just changed the way we listen. By changing the way you listen, you're changing the engagement with, with men suddenly expanding. So that's just another aside to show that this kind of thing is very relevant. I think uh, you've heard, uh, I've heard you say before about uh, building rapport when you're, you're dealing with men. And this, this quote reminds me a bit of that, because uh, this bit about there can be a lot of talking around the subject. Uh, yeah, I mean, what, uh, in some, a lot of Samaritans' calls are being closed down by the by the, the, the Samaritans training ethos was that if, it, if you're not talking about your feelings, you're not getting anywhere, so just close it down. Which was, you know, you could argue that that's, that's based on a model of therapy, which is that the more you, you sort of lay, you're talking about feeling words, uh, then you're doing something useful. If you're not talking about feeling words, then you're not doing something useful. But actually, in truth, when, if a guy was talking about football, they were engaging and connecting with you, and then they built trust, and then it led into feelings. But if you don't start with an engagement where the person is, you've actually closed down conversations. So you want to say something? Yes. When you're treating patient, you try and separate the uh, conditions and situations from the thinking. Uh, well, basically, uh, when you're, when you're trying to help someone, you try to help them in the context of the way they think and their situation. So psychology is all context-based, you know. So if someone's feeling bad and they've just lost the job and they've just lost someone they love, then the feeling bad is, is different context. And so, it, you know, it's a kind of, we're trying to help people how they're reacting to situations and what meaning. It really, all, psychology always comes down to the meaning you make of situations. If things, just take an example, if someone loses their legs, one person will become a Paralympian, another person will go to Dignitas and get killed, and they kill themselves. So it's the same event, but the meaning of it is very different. So what we're interested in is why are men and women on average making different meanings of things, so that we need to factor in gender. So when a man talks about football, it's a kind of shy way of getting into an engagement and then it leads to something else. We've had cases where having talked about football, you end up with, oh, my wife's just died, you know, but they wouldn't have gone straight in with that. This is sort of so. So when you're trying to help people, the situation is always important. I think even if you're a medical person you know, intervening, if you're time, you always need to try and know someone's story. So you're kind of personalizing the care. And what th uh, therapy culture tends to do is depersonalise it. So, you know, CBT works for depression. <laughs> but everyone's an individual. And gender is part of that individuality. I don't know if that answers your question. But it's also very quite, does that happen quite across cultures? 
of specific, specifically, so you find the feelings that when working with men, that right across the culture is a longer lead up time and you kind of really need to kind of skirt around the issue before kind of going quite right deep into it. I think my experience of that does is on, on average, again it's average, because I'm, I'm a guy, I've been in psychoanalysis, so I'm a man, but I talk about my feelings, one of my started in psychoanalysis, I didn't, you know, I went straight into it, but that's because the context is, is different, but I think on average men are, and, and cross-culturally too, yeah, men, men are different, and in, the suicide rates are higher for men across all cultures. So there's a kind of narrative building that men hang on to stuff, they don't talk about it, they try to soldier on and deal with it on their own, then they reach a point of no return and they kill themselves and they feel too ashamed to, to reveal that. But uh, also the way we're trying to help them might be putting pressure on them to, might, might actually be going against the grain of what would help them getting into help. If you, if you offered men help that wasn't so in your face feelings, they might end up Feeling support. I mean, you know, a lot of what works with, with, with men is uh, is just doing stuff that isn't even about feelings. It's just playing football, you know, having a football team. Because, it, again, it comes back to what is our concept of therapy? Is our concept of therapy is based on a medical model, which is you have depression, we're going to treat it. Okay, if drugs don't work, we'll talk to you. That's a bit pretty unscientific. But if you have a model of therapy that says, if you're feeling depressed, it's because certain things aren't happening in your life. You're not feeling cared about, you're not feeling listened to, you're not feeling you belong to anybody, you're not feeling you have any sense of achievement or purpose in life. We'd all feel depressed without those needs being met. And so therefore, the, to, to resolve that in people, the therapies when they do work, they make people feel cared about, they make people feel they're listened to, they make people feel they belong, and they make people feel they've achieved something and that they have some purpose. So what we're positing in this research is if you want to make a man feel cared about and listened to, you might need to do it in a way that fits with, with the way the guy is presenting rather than simply throw a kind of one unisex kind of model. So again, these are huge issues and that, the fact that you're here in this lecture hall means you're probably a forward-thinking person that you're even thinking about this because there's not enough mainstream interest in this, in the subject, is there? But, you know, it is progressing, but then, of course there are issues around therapy generally. What is it, why does it work? It always boils down to relationships. So if it boils down to relationships, men and women do have different styles of communication. At least it's a hypothesis worth testing, but no one's even asking the question. So, sorry, you wanted to say something? I, I realize I came late, so maybe this is already an answer. Yeah, yeah. Well, but this, these are all then second order issues, but yeah, it's not avoid of the feelings, it's like uh, they show them differently and, and deal with them differently. Oh, okay. And so I would argue, just say you had an evolutionary hypothesis about emotional processing, mm -hmm. that your male was kind of in dangerous situations on average, you know, because probably that's even true to this day, you know, people who are dying at work are mainly men because they're doing these dangerous jobs. So probably the male has evolved to shut feelings out and focus on a task because that's safer than if you let emotions come in. It's like if you're trying to land a plane on a, you know, you see what I mean? There's a kind of style of thinking which if you get the emotion out of it, just focus on the task. It's actually quite adaptive, but it's not adaptive if you're depressed to do that. But it is adaptive if you want to survive and you're in a war or you're trying to kill something that's going to eat you if you don't kill it. So these are evolutionary you can have evolutionary hypotheses about that. And also there, there are types of styles of thinking that, and emotional processing that might be more useful. And as therapists, we should be recognizing what mode of thinking someone's in. But we're just saying CBT, you know, process your feelings. And, and a counseling culture is very much, you know, how are you feeling? And uh, labeling feelings might be off-putting for, for men. And these, these are questions we're trying to and, and so it would change for transgender. Uh, you're going to get a, a man, a woman type man, will probably talk more about feelings. Yeah, absolutely. But I always find that if we transgender people, uh, their gender is their identity, so that that's the mode they're in, you know, very often. And that, would, that, that would affect whether they are talking about feelings or not. Yeah. Yeah, I think someone who is a male transgender 
would be more in a male mode of, of communicating. That's my experience, working with transgender. That people are female. Yeah, uh, male yeah. to female. Yeah. Yes. They'd be more open to a female. Yeah, absolutely, right? because I think that uh, they are female, you know, in terms of the psychology. Yeah. Transgender doesn't mean, I mean, people are transgender because the gender that they are assigned is not what outwardly look like, isn't actually correct for them. Which proves that gender is something that is a difference, otherwise you'd be happy, wouldn't you? If you if a transgender person, if gender didn't mean anything, you could just adapt. But you don't, because you're in the wrong body. So that means that the gender differences are very important. The transgender proves that gender difference is so important for us. What's do with hormones then? I would say transgender is biologically based because we socialise people who look like boys to be boys, they should be boys. But some of them feel like girls, so there must be a biological basis for that. But that's another, another lecture. Okay, so going back to uh, category two of, um, of the findings from our study. So many participants highlighted the importance of society in the two subcategories of socialization and social interventions when considering men engaging in therapy. Several participants noted that men are socialized to embody masculinity and that this might be a barrier to seeking help. I'm quoting one of the therapists. Men are supposed to work things out on their own according to the stereotype. Be stoical and stand on their own two feet and not have to go to a father figure or a mother figure. And certainly not somebody who's trained, say, as a counselor or a psychotherapist. So I think the reason, the primary reason, for their not seeking my kind of care that I might provide would be because I would, it would be admitting that they can't figure things out on their own, admitting that they need help. So we're talking directly about the help-seeking aspect of things here. So um, in terms of socialization, socialization was seen by some participants as generally a negative thing for men. Some participants suggested or implied that masculinity was a creation of culture and was causal in creating psychological problems for men and making them feel pressure to succeed and also causing them not to seek help for fear of looking weak. For example, one participant emphasized that the importance of confidentiality to men is based on the macho culture. Quote, it's very important for them to know what, what they say is going to be confidential and that they perceive that things are going to be confidential. They don't want it leaking out, because if it leaks out, then other guys might have an advantage on them. They might be vulnerable in the world of men. It's actually quite a concrete reason for not seeking help if you think that what you say is going to be used against you. It's a common thing in prison, isn't it? <laughs> if you go to see the psychologist in the prison, you're dead. You know? Sorry, you wanted to say something? Surely this is about vulnerability shaming of small boys that doesn't happen to small girls. Girls are allowed to have their feelings. They're perfectly validated in having their feelings, whereas boys are devalidated in having feelings. And because it's mothers, predominantly women over the centuries, who have socialized boys into being men through childhood. And father is away. He's, you know, really, since the Industrial Revolution, uh, fathers have been outside. And so <coughs> there's no emotional literacy learned from the father. It's all learned from the mother. Um, and so, well, you know, I knew as a boy growing up, I wasn't supposed to have feelings. If I had feelings, there was something wrong with me because I'd get punished. And then that translates into, into adolescence, the adult that I am not a girl or I am not female, so I do not cry. And then once you get to adulthood, it's completely complex and crazy because the adult world is very different. You are on, on your own, but by then, girls have built very, very complex, intimate social networks. And boys are very, well, young men are very much on their own. This is a very important question. I mean, these are the big questions about socialization, nature, and all this stuff. But I, I make a very good point that, that socialization of boys is largely by adult females. Which would have raised the question if, if, that was tr if that was true, and it might be, why would adult females want to shame boys over their feelings? That, that would raise another question. Because we're, we're trying to get a, you know, a female friendly world, you, you would think that boys would, would, weren't being shamed. You know, if they were raised by their macho guys, they would be shamed for their feelings. But if they're raised by the women, why aren't they being socialised to be more 
okay with their feelings. So that, these are hypotheses, but it's well, very, very important question. Just looking at this category, if, if we were referencing this now, it's just written on the screen to yeah. women, if we would say girly culture, sorry, that's all I can throw at yeah, we would be castigated as victim blaming. And that's what I see. That doesn't help a young man who wants to kill himself reading that. It doesn't. It doesn't stop him. In fact, mm -hmm. it encourages him to do that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because effectively, that's about trust. Yeah. It's not macho culture. It's just like, oh, I'm going to be with somebody who's trained to deal with emotions and has, knows about emotions. literacy, And they're not going to shame me for making mistakes, for staying wrong. That is about trust, and that's what's valuable about therapy, in my own experience. Yeah, I mean, once you get to therapy, you can do a lot of that work to de-shame it. But the question is, and that's another question we're going to raise, which is that the sort of guys that we're basing our data on, who've seen therapists, are the sort of guys who've sought therapy. They're not representative of the guys who are killing themselves. So this is another issue of representativeness, that the guys who are in therapy are at the more, a little bit less, sort of more comfortable with their feelings end of the spectrum of masculinity, whatever that is. And therefore, we haven't even got, the only data we've got about masculine feel, uh, attitudes to emotion is in the suicide figures and other things. Uh, because therapy population, the people who seek therapy, are predominantly women. I think when I was in the NHS, it's about 66, 67% of my clients were female over the years. And I, became a specialist in helping women in many ways. We're very privileged to do it because you know, a lot of important work uh, was done. But you can't, and I didn't even think about the fact that, <laughs> that I wasn't thinking about gender, the male gender. I didn't think about male gender until I was in my 40s as a psychologist. So, we said, so blind him, sorry. Uh, based on that, what made you decide to interview therapists rather than men? We've done both. We've done both. <laughs> Well, that was uh, two weeks ago. Oh. Yes. <laughs> okay. Fast workers. Okay, so uh, the final category. The final category. Um, so uh, reluctance to attribute differences to gender. So throughout the three subcategories, um, we had uh, uh, the uh, one of the, the kind of I, I think most interesting ideas was this this kind of uh, defence against uh, seeing uh, genders there. Um, so, one quote, depending on what people present with, we turn out the therapy to what people's needs are. Uh, so it may be that we, what kind of, uh, that we use a kind of general CBT outline first, but it might go down a different route. I don't think it's gendered. So, uh, so some people just said that gender wasn't an issue, like people might be different for, for various different reasons, but it wasn't due, their differences weren't due to gender. And, um, I think we had, I mean, I think from that one quote, you don't really get uh, very much of a flavour of, of the, uh, how big a theme this was in the coaches' interviews and in the interviews in this study. I mean, we did have people saying, uh, like, there aren't any gender differences. And then a couple of minutes later, they'd be talking about differences between men and women. Um, so they, they seem to be kind of, in some ways, not just apologising for talking about gender differences, but even oblivious to the fact that, that they realise that there are gender differences. So we, we have a kind of, it's an interesting, so maybe it's a, it's a kind of a, a very, we talk about unconscious bias a lot in terms of gender, but I mean, I think this is a really, un, really interesting unconscious bias that, that we have here. And we've talked about it in terms of cognitive distance. I mean, you can apply, you know, any kind of psychological theory of conflict or, in the distance, but the idea that you hear yourself saying that men and women are different in some respect, and then some other aspect of your expectation of yourself is that, that you shouldn't be believing. It's, a, you know, it's like you're committing all some kind of thought crime by saying, oh gosh, men and women are a bit different. So then you come and say, oh, I don't really, it's not really gender, but you know, it is gender. So a conflict is produced by a, a pressure on people to assume that in some ways there aren't gender differences. Uh, which is another, uh, which then closes down inquiry. And anything that closes down inquiry is obviously un un unscientific and probably not very good for us as all of us, because we all, if gender's a big part of our lives, the more we understand it, the more we can all live together better. And exactly this whole gender blind approach is, is like a one size 
its own, like no tailor required, just take one size of, of a therapy and, and impose it on everybody. I mean, it, that's not much use. Samaritans was that if people were working unconsciously differently without knowing it, you wouldn't have got an objective change from it, training them differently. So clearly there was some objective difference in the response of the male callers to Samaritans because something had changed in the way the listening was happening, which implies that there was enough of a difference in the way uh, Samaritan volunteers are listening to men and women to mean that it is that they're, they're, even if they're reluctant to say there are any differences, uh, you know, in, in some ways that it, that it has made a difference to, uh, in, in objective terms, to, to something. You know, because if we were unconsciously giving women and men what they need, without but not being ashamed to admit it, we wouldn't we, we wouldn't get outcomes different, uh, different outcomes like that. But we are getting gender differences and outcomes. From, I am working differently. But if you ask me <coughs> between my male and female clients, but if you ask me what am I doing differently, I find it much harder to, to say it, to, to do it. And I, but that's why I think other people need to objectively to look at the yeah. differences in working and before you can say yes, there are definitely definitely a future study. Yes, yeah. about very important to, to look at it from that side too. I certainly found as I became more aware of gender in the male side of my clients, I, I became, I, I felt like I was getting a lot further with people because I was trying to connect with, uh, connect with uh, something that, I wasn't trying to impose a kind of therapeutic model, I was trying to connect with, with a, a different world and gender was part of that. But uh, for me, the whole idea of offering a one size fits all treatment doesn't apply to anybody, so gender is just another factor. You know, so if you're a good therapist, it, 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 you know, no doubt you are, you're kind of tuning in to the individual, aren't you? And you, you are doing that, so you probably are making an answer for gender a little bit without knowing it. But definitely with Samaritans, they're being taught to explore feelings. So that's quite an active pressure. Thing. And counselling training, and I do a lot of supervision and counsellors, there's a, there's a culture of person-centred exploring feelings. Kind of, it's kind of assumed as the right thing to do. And of course, maybe it is at one level, but it's how you do that. You're ex you can explore someone's feelings without saying, tell me your feelings. You can do it by doing stuff with someone and the feelings come out in a different way. <coughs> Can't you change the words you use for a man as you would Yes, you yeah. absolutely. I mean, I went to it last year at, at the conference. He showed that using yes. language helps oh, absolutely. come out. And, and to show that. I mean, it's the Calm, the charity Calm, which has had a great, uh, you've probably all heard of it, but it's campaign against living miserably. It's focused on male suicide. It, 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 they've had quite amazing results in getting guys to phone in. And, and what they've done is basically, they haven't got it perfect. There's lots of areas where it seems like there's still, you know, there's still this kind of underlying idea men have got to change and open up and all this stuff. But actually what they've, uh, what they've been really doing is using male-friendly language, especially for young men. There's things like feeling shit, call this number. They haven't said, are you depressed? Mm. You know, if you say to someone, are you depressed? Then you're going to turn off men and women, probably, to some extent, but men more, because that word really does hit a kind of 
Whereas if you say feeling shit, that's kind of male friendly. Yeah, God, I'm feeling shit. If you, if you use language which actually connects with your, and that, but that's not, that's true of all of us. If someone uses language that connects with us, and I think Marv did say that with, with the soldiers. If you use language uh, which isn't about exploring emotions in a feminized kind of language, but actually just get alongside, do this, we're going to do this together, we're going to, and you make it sort of almost military language, yeah. you're still processing feelings. I know, but I, I mean, I've had soldiers as clients, and, you know, uh, basically you've got to connect with them. I had one soldier who was a poet, and he just read all his poems out to me, and he processed everything, because someone was listening to his poems. But the point is that, you can't, do, you don't want to get nice guidelines saying we must get all soldiers reading poems out. See, this is the problem we've got with science. We think something works, we've got to give it to everybody. What make, this is what psychologists should be taught, is how to think creatively with each individual. Well, the example that Murdoch used was one guy saying he's coming here, he wasn't coming for therapy, he was going to one fucking shit. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a good plan, and that's exactly right. right. That, that's the language that is suitable to that person. If you'd said that, they never would have walked away. Yeah. I love that unfucking your shit prayer. <laughs> <laughs> you, you see that in the last guidelines. <laughs> um, so I think what we're what we're dealing with here is uh, like some sort of unconscious bias. Um, it's been described as as beta bias, the, the kind of tendency of the social sciences to uh, minimise gender differences and kind of emphasise gender similarities. And that's become quite popular after uh, Janet Hyde's work where she's, she's coined the phrase uh, there is more similarities than differences. And, and of course there are more similarities between men and women and there are differences. But really the differences might be quite important and quite worth exploring. And the, the, the similarities might not make much impact in terms of therapy. They, they probably are important, but the, the differences might be key. The, the differences might be the, 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 the difference between somebody coming to therapy and unfucking their shit or you know, not going to therapy and choking themselves off a bridge. Well, the way I'd look at it is the similarity is you need to have your feelings connected with, but the difference is the language you use to make the connection. So we are both similar, and the human condition is the same for all of us. We all want to be loved, heard, uh, you know, as I said, belong, and all these psychological needs we all have and we'd all be depressed if we didn't have someone who cared about us, didn't have someone who listened to us, didn't have someone we felt we belonged to, and we didn't have any sense of achievement or meaning. We'd all be suicidal tomorrow. But how you stop someone from feeling suicidal and how you connect with someone and care about them will have to, have to be very different. I mean, if you're a teacher, you have to reach certain children differently. Some, if you're a football manager, they talk about putting a shoulder around some players and beating others up the other. So we're all different. It's how you connect with people, but we all need the same things. But how you deliver them is very, very different. So it's not about are we the same or are we different, it's both. Sorry. It's a bit out of the scope of the study you've done. There's obviously a big push towards digital therapies, remote Skype sessions, things like that. <coughs> Have you found any evidence that men engage in we have somebody here who's done a survey uh, asking men and women whether they've got diff uh, prefer different preferences for different approaches to therapy and uh, different ways of coping with stress. As I understand it, the, the, there wasn't any difference in, it, like surprisingly, there wasn't any difference in how much people used online, went to online type stuff. No gender difference. It's kind of interesting because you, you would kind of think that men spend a lot of time uh, playing online playing video games and things and as I understand it there was a big difference uh, between men and women in how much they, they use video games for, for uh, dealing with stress. Yeah. Well, so that's where a lot of the campaign yes, is yeah. as well, it's you know, yes. you talk to your friends on social media which might actually say again be a disconnect from actually men not to game. Yeah. If, you, if you designed a, a, a war game called Zap Your Shit for young men, you might find we could reduce the suicide rate tomorrow, but maybe we ought to go to production. But that would be my hypothesis. If you zap your shit and you made it a video game and you had to shoot your shit and had to understand what it was, you could probably get young boys really getting engaged with their feelings in a male friendly way. You could. <laughs>